Okay, I'm going to call to order the July 14th Ordinance Committee meeting. I'm Councilor David Murphy, Councilor Ryan O'Donnell, Councilor Maureen Carney is expected. I'm going to announce that we are doing audio and video recording and taking minutes of the meeting. Um, I call for public comment, but there is no member of the public in the room at the moment. Um, I'm imagining we'll have people for the public hearing when that starts at 5.30, so we'll move forward with the agenda otherwise. Um, so the first thing we can do is deal with our minutes of the last meeting. Um, I move approval of the minutes of July 9th and June, excuse me, June 9th and June 16th. All right. And I will second that. No corrections, no discussion? Excuse All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Our next item of business is an appointment to the Board of Public Works of Pactor Goggins of 20 Bridge Road in Florence for a term. Um, from July to March 2015 to fill the unexpired term of Christopher Helmick. Um, so I, I would make a motion for a positive recommendation. <clears throat> and I'll second that motion. I have known Mr. Goggins for many, many years, and I understand you have spoken with him as well, so I certainly feel he's qualified. Mm -hmm. So uh, all in favor of that positive recommendation? Aye. Aye. All right. Um, and that concludes our business until the public hearing, which is not scheduled to take place for another seven minutes or so. So we are going to uh, recess for a moment, and then we'll come back uh, at the appointed 5.30 hour of the public hearing and complete our business for today. So we're back from recess. This is the uh, Ordinance Committee meeting of July 14th. And we are going to reopen a continued public hearing. We have some business that's continuing, and then we have some new business to take care of uh, during this session. But I think you folks are here for seven or more unit zoning, correct? So correct. We will do that one first. And I don't know whether you, you want to make just statements up front before we start. Carolyn's going to present some changes to it, and I don't know whether you want to let her present and then make your comment. You want to make your comment up front? Since there's only two people here, we can be pretty informal yeah. about, about this. Whatever the board well, desires. Whichever you'd like to do, if you want to. Well, there's just a few of us here. You know, we already talked. You know my concerns that uh, I mean, it's been going on for four years now, and you know we've been paying taxes for the past four years, and mm -hmm. we're not getting a return or anything on it, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's becoming a burden on my family, my father, Donald Shaw, and his health is not doing very good, and a lot of a lot of do it is the motel itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, all his memories are there. His mom recently passed. I don't know if anybody knows Josephine, if you knew her at all. You know, did we, she pass away? She did, yes. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, that. she did. Yeah. You know, so I mean, that was uh, uh, it was a little over a year ago now she passed away. That's been really hard on him. And every time anything comes with the motel, it brings memories back of her. And I mean, he's retired now. He just wants to move on. So but we're just trying to get this thing rolling a little more, you know. And plus the place, you know, like, like it was on fire once. Winter's coming. You, you have homeless people around town. They're going to break in there again and build fires. So we're just concerned about it. We just want to get it rolling. I mean, I don't know how else to say about it. And Anthony, do you have any? Sure. Uh, you just, if I could add uh, to what Mark said, um, I'm the real estate agent on the matter. And we understand your desire that you, you want to get it right because it means a lot for the city of Northampton. And we know planning's been working on it very hard as well. Um, but at the same time, we, um, we're hoping that it will get passed soon so then the project that um, has been presented informally can go to a formal stage. And uh, Mark's family has had the property for years and um, they do have uh, it under purchase and sale. And it, it, is, it appears to be a, a, a great developer it appears to be a good project. There would be seven or more units. Um, we've already had your draft um, and already had some informal discussions with planning on some of the things that you're going to want there and the way it's going to look and um, the way it's going to be incorporated into the neighborhood. So the developer understands that. And um, it is our hope that you could pass it sooner than later so we can get the project moving forward. All right. And you're welcome to stay. Carolyn's going to present a couple of things here. And you're welcome to stay and comment on that if you like. And then so please, the floor is yours. Okay, so since 
the um, hearing in May um, and then early June. The planning board um, took comments that and that um, were brought to the floor and discussed between the board as well as with the public, um, and really spent some time to make um, text changes to try to address those. So I'll go through the sections that they addressed, and I want to add also that um, after the planning board met at the staff level, we inserted one additional change um, in the first paragraph of um, bullet, um, bullet three, um, and that was that um, to specify that any uh, project that creates uh, seven or more units in one or more phases within a five-year period. That phrase was added so that um, to try to um, ensure that we're looking at projects comprehensively and they don't get parsed down below the seven-unit number um, just to avoid the special permit process. Mm -hmm. And do you have additional copies of what you're going over for these gentlemen? We only have I do. Yeah. And you're, you're going to, which one are you going to go over, C? Yeah, um, well, I have. I mean, they're really similar. They're the same, um, except for one allows multifamily and the other allows multifamily and, or townhouse only, not multifamily. Yeah. What I have that I distributed was um, um, Urban Residential B. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and, the, the, and the property they're here about is, is C. It is C, yeah, okay. exactly, right? Yeah, um, and that, that uh, Sh um, Shaw's motel site. So um, the, and then just today we received comments from um, Councilor, uh, uh, City Solicitor, um, Alan Seawald. So I want to go over those two, Councilor Donnell, I don't know if you saw that. that I just saw it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I brought okay. a copy Great. with me. So you're going to do your planning board stuff first? Yeah. Okay. So um, planning board focused on, um, you know, there's some comments. I guess the first paragraph was pretty much um, no change. The second paragraph, all projects shall be oriented. And, we, and the board talked about, and, and I can't recall, I think we talked about this with ordinance committee. Um, but there are some that definitely planning board went ahead and, and made recommendations for changing. That is added language about um, orienting the projects to the street. So try to clarify that by saying connect and relate to the street, including making streetscape improvements between the building and the, pro and the sidewalk. And um, to clarify that um, there may be some streetscape improvements that need to be um, incorporated that include rebuilding the public sidewalk in front of the building so improvements incorporating that would incorporate low impact development standards when possible for any necessary drainage improvements triggered by these changes so there was just some clarification in there there weren't really any substantive changes um, and um, also at the end of that paragraph uh, there was a discussion about um, Clarifying um, the a design in which you would have a dead end street um, that um, to ensure that it creates a connection somewhere in the project as opposed to um, I mean and, and really that was the intent from all along but it was really just to clarify that um, you know you can have a pedestrian connection anywhere along a dead end street so long as it's connecting to somewhere through bike bicycle or, or walking means to another part of the project. <coughs> and then bullet three relates to, and I will say that we reorganized some of these points so that we were collapsing with common issues um, um, sequentially one after the other. So some of these have been rearranged. So for now, the new bullet three is all projects shall include a park or common area fully designed and constructed to be integrated into the project which is also easily accessible and available for residents of the project. And then we, there was a lot of discussion about what that minimum size should be or how, how that should count. So the planning board upped it from 75 square feet to 100 square feet minimum or 10 square feet per dwelling unit, a buildable area, whichever is greater. Um, so that um, 
there was a lot of debate about what made sense for a minimum size, and they thought 100 square feet was appropriate. Yeah. Good question. Was it 10 square feet per unit during our last hearing? Yes. So that didn't change. That didn't change. Just the baseline. So whichever one is great. So it was 75. So it has to be at least. I think it was. I thought it was 75 was the original number. And Perhaps then, there was no minimum in the original. I remember. Oh, maybe you're right. I'm sorry. I've gone over this so many times. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So 100 was a minimum or. Yeah, yeah it. right. I think you're right. Sorry about that. Um, so um, then the. Um, there was, a, there was discussion at the planning board to clarify the language in bullet number seven. Driveways and private roads shall be designed to function as private alleys or shared streets. These are all defined in the subdivision regulations. Um, but there was a lot of wordsmithing that went on at, um, with planning board to make it clear about those standards. Um, and But the, but the context and the, the text um, didn't really change um, from a substantive standpoint. It was really more trying to make it cleaner. Yeah. When you say um, you're on bullet four. No, I jumped to bullet seven you because there bullet weren't seven. any changes really for the two, four, five, okay. or six. Sorry, I got I got a lesson. Yeah, sorry about that. Nothing. Then there was a problem. There was an issue with the now what's now bullet six had kept getting it was just a word processing um, takeover where the word processing wanted to bump create two bullets out of that so there was a so number six used to be two bullets only because of um, a computer error <laughs> um, but so the new number seven is the one I was talking about and then the new number eight um, um, there is about the energy and then the home, they um, originally had said energy standards and affordable housing. Um, and so now I'll, I'll read through what it says and then sort of go over the changes. Buildings shall meet one of the following environmental standards. A, meet home energy rating system or HERS rating at least 25% lower than the current energy stretch code at the time the special permit is requested, or B, uh, the U.S. Green Building Council lead new construction gold or neighborhood development gold certified. Now, originally A had a specific HERS rating number, and um, first it was 45, then it went to 41, and so the board, I think everybody was talking about that, where did you get that number, what makes sense? So in the end, um, the planning board thought it was probably more valuable to just show that we want some percentage greater than the standard, than the current stretch code, and the stretch code is going to change over time. So this moves when the stretch code moves, but it also shows that we want it to be that much more energy efficient. So that's why we took out the actual number. What was the average HERS rate, or what is the average HERS rate? Um, now I'm going to forget that number. Right now, um, you don't have to go Louis has worked it. It was um, somewhere in the, let's see, um, I think it was in the, I want to say high 40s or low 50s. Okay. So your number of 40 or 41 <coughs> is approximately the same as 20 or 25 percent. Yes. Right. And that was it. That's where they landed with 25%, basically. Uh -huh. I see. Um, and then the other item about um, affordability was there was a lot of discussion about, so the fir there are two points to that. Um, contain 10% of the units meeting the city's definition of affordability, or contain 25% or more of the units of no longer than 1,200 square feet per gross floor area for at least five years. So there was a lot of discussion about, you know, the fact that the size, mandating a certain size isn't necessarily going to equate to affordability. 
but there was there's still a great interest in meeting different size characteristics. So, frankly, the the thing that was taken out, the item that was taken out, was the term affordability, um, and that's really the change there. Um, and um, because they felt like both things were important to sort of as a goal as a target. And then on bullet type 10. That's a quick question. Yeah. I mean to interrupt you, but um, has, has the housing partnership weighed in on, on bullet nine specifically? Yes. They also decided that they didn't like the fact that there was the term affordability assigned to 1,200 square feet. Right. Um, so they felt like they didn't even want that standard in there. The planning board felt like it's still important to have, but because we need to meet, and the, frankly, the housing plan says we need to meet all these things, not just targeted or subsidized affordable housing, but housing at all levels for all different um, ages and um, income levels. So um, they felt like it's still important as a planning goal to have smaller units, but. Um, they agreed and recognized the fact that this doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be affordable. Um, so item 10, um, the, there was just some clarification in the language in the last paragraph about who's going to be issuing this, the permit that it's not staff, and they really just added the word planning board at the very last tail end of that. Um, and that's, uh, that's the extent of the substantive changes from the planning board. Um, and then as you know, then um, Solicitor Seawald sent his comments um, this morning. And um, so I'll, we can run through those now unless you have questions about what the planning board no, I'm good with planning board things. Okay. So going back to bullet number two, um, he's concerned that the terms all projects shall be oriented, connected, and related to the street, as well as the term pedestrian friendly, um, is too vague. So um, I think that. Um, Oh shoot, and I didn't get a chance to get the full citation. But, um, you know, one of the options is, I don't think connected and related to the street, he actually added the, the past tense for those connected and related to the street. Um, um, I think the next phrase clarifies that, including making the streetscape between the property and the road pavement. Um, pedestrian friendly and in conformance with city standards, we could change pedestrian friendly or add, you know, to safe and accommodating to pedestrians, safe, accommodating and attractive to pedestrians, or to um, pedestrian friendly and then put a reference to the literature. There's a lot of literature about what pedestrian friendly means, so I don't think from a de developer's perspective or someone who understands urban form has any problem understanding what pedestrian friendly is. Um, so, you know, we could either, my recommendation would be to per potentially just um, reference the fact, um, pedestrian friendly, parentheses, following literature um, by new urbanists and other professionals in the field. Uh, I mean, there, or I could cite books, there, there's a lot of literature about it. Might be good to have it in the zoning somewhere. Or can get referred to at any number of levels rather than referring out to something. To okay. Put in the definition, just like the affordable housing definition. Well, I could um, work, oh, that, that's probably a good idea because we use it a lot. We talk about it a lot, but you just have it in there, refer yeah. to the definition. So, would you like me to put together a definition then for as a new item? to introduce that sort of it wouldn't come out at the same time potentially but i could do that and then it would live in there in the definition right. and could be referred to from within the ordinance and okay yeah <clears throat> it's always that way it's not right which edition of 
right. the new urbanist's right. version of this is the one you're talking about. Right. If it's in there, it's in there. Okay, okay. yeah, that's fair. Yep. And in, in general, I mean, I don't know if the solicitor has ultimately specific recommendations you could make as well to cure some of the questions or answer the questions he raises. <laughs> I know he, he raises many questions. <laughs> Um, well, then further down when he says, does this, um, is the landscaping required or does it apply only if the developer decides to landscape and developer shall rebuild, is that what you mean? So I've clarified that, so under such streetscape includes rebuilding by the applicant, I could add that text, um, as necessary. And, um, and I think the idea is any landscaping incorporated between the street and the building shall enhance the streetscape. I think that's what the whole special permit review is about. Maybe there's no need to add landscape. Maybe you're taking an existing building and adding on to it and going over seven units. Or maybe the streetscape and landscape area between the sidewalk and any new building is already well established. So I think it's not necessarily, I mean, to answer this question, it's not necessarily the case that someone's going to be putting all new landscaping in. It may be parts of landscaping. It may be the whole thing. It may be nothing. And that's kind of what special permit review is about for planning board to look at each case uniquely and individually. So I, if you're comfortable with keeping that language as it is, understanding that that's what it would be, um, that's certainly fine with us as long as it, it's, I think we do need to clarify that that will be done by the applicant. It's expected to be done by the applicant. Mm -hmm. no, and that, and that, when he, he sent me this today and gave me a quick phone call and he said, I just wanted, you know, this is, this is an ordinance. It's something that the applicant should be able to figure out exactly what's expected of them yeah. when they when they start. So, um, does it does it pass that muster? Is more a question from him than for uh -huh. us. Does he think it's sufficiently clear that an applicant will know what's expected of them up front? Right. So that that's really a solicitor call. Okay. It's well, I would propose adding, you know, such streetscape includes rebuilding by the applicant as necessary, granite curbs, ADA compliant sidewalks, but maybe that should go um, any landscaping incorporated by the applicant between the street and the building shall, you know, maybe I should also add it there mm -hmm. as part of the design by the applicant. But so is, are, is this list of, of items, are these what every applicant would be required to do if they choose to do landscaping? Or is this fixed by saying such streetscape may, may include rebuilding? And yes, may include. Because that kind of solves yeah. it too. I mean, yeah, okay. I'm not saying that's how it should read. I'm just the street, it may include rebuilding. Oh, yeah. Right, because again, the as necessary indicates that it may not they may not have to do it. So by adding to, yeah. such streetscape may include. And then with the process for getting the special permit makes the determination of what items are necessary. Is that how that would go? Right, so these are all the things we would look at. Right. And if they're not there, then the applicant would be required to put them there. All, or only as necessary. Only as necessary, so okay. if, for instance, there might be perfectly adequate sidewalks right. and, and access points to the project. Okay. Um, in other situations, the sidewalk may be all in disrepair, you know, panels missing, panels broken, uh -huh. curb missing. Uh -huh. Like we many of our sidewalks. Yes. <laughs> like many of our sidewalks. Right, but, and it's not, and this isn't new. We require this um, anytime, you know, for example, a project on King Street, if someone's coming to rebuild a site, if the sidewalk is in bad repair, they're responsible for making it. Um, New five foot sidewalk. Right, and curb. So it's 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 very consistent with what we already do, mm -hmm. and it's all site dependent. Mm -hmm. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, so we I don't know what sure. the conditions are. Absolutely. And from my discussion, we just didn't want to make it so subjective that you don't know until you actually get there. You know that from reading yeah. this, you want to have some idea. Of how high the hurdle was rather than have to come here to find out. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, we would want that too. We try to make sure people understand. Um, and then moving down the, in a further in the paragraph, um, 
he's asking drivers and roadways shall internally and externally connect, and he asks to what? <laughs> um, I remember we had this discussion like, you know, oh, yeah. if it's a landlocked pulp, if it's a landlocked 400 foot driveway, what are you going to connect to? Um, but if you have an inch, if you have a, so basically the idea is we don't want you to build two dead end streets. They would need to connect to each other in some fashion. You're allowed to do a dead end street as long as it doesn't exceed 500 square feet. So this is on the site being developed. Right. So you don't want. We want roads to connect to the to the streets okay. already existing. We want driveways to connect to other things in the. But if you put in a single 400 foot driveway, right. is it going to be required to connect to something or not? No, and it says avoid dead ends whenever possible. But dead end roadways and driveways shall never exceed 500 and must include bike head connection. So the second sent the last sentence deals with what the situation where you would create a dead end street. Mm -hmm. But bicycle and pedestrian connections from the dead end street to a street common area, park or civic space. Right. What if there's nothing there? Then you create, then, well, further down you're required to have a park. So we want your, somehow to have that park on site connect to um, the street that you're creating. So if there is. Um, but could it connect in the middle? Yes. So it can connect anywhere. Right. Not at the end. And that was one of the pieces that, that the planning board discussed. <coughs> they want to make sure that it can include, um, it can be anywhere. It doesn't have to be from the end of the dead end street. So it's from somewhere on the dead end street to another place. So you're not just creating a dead end that you can actually get somewhere from your street. I would almost suggest breaking it into two parts for the purpose of clarity. Okay. Say for just an idea to bounce off. For developments that have one street, here are the rules. For developments with more than one street, here are the rules. And here are the rules that apply to either situation. That way you could clarify if you have two streets, that's when you want them to connect to each other. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then whether or not you have one street or two streets, you still want bicycle connections, mm -hmm. things like that. But that way it's clear. I mean, uh, dead end streets are not prohibited. It's just if you have two dead end streets, you really want them to connect to each other. So break that out maybe where you start, have a sub paragraph from that section, perhaps? Yeah, just connectivity. Okay. Could be a subsection. Yeah, because it's a shell. Driveway and roadway shell internally and externally connect and avoid dead ends whenever possible. So they shall, but only whenever possible. It's still a very confusing. Um, and if you can connect to your internal common area, which was which is only required to be accessible to the people in the subdivision thing because they're the only ones that can legally be there. Right. Yeah. It's just still. Um, okay, so. Yeah, because that's where his other comment is does this connection need to lead to anywhere off site? So a sub paragraph connections to. Yeah. Is the connection to the. Right. The common area with no outlet to the rest of the thing. Okay. That's kind of the entire question. Okay, so drivers and road race show. Okay. So you're suggesting projects that include more than one access. Um, versus projects that might just be dead ends. Okay. I mean that that's one possible solution. Imagine you don't have to write it now. I guess it depends on what you want to do tonight. <laughs> 
whether you're intending to move it forward, I can spend some time looking at it, or if you want it to come back. I thought we already kind of talked about having this, really deal with this in September. Do you care? Yeah, I don't, at least for, for Alan's stuff, I don't think we can actually rewrite it right now. I mean, it's Well, next I think a lot of it, we can, because some of it I think he doesn't, uh, I think we can easily clarify. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah. Um, I mean, his next comment, he doesn't think it's going to pass constitutional muster. I mean, I don't think yeah. <laughs> well, well, that's easy. I mean, first of all, there's a lot of debate on whether that's, in fact, I mean, there are people on both sides of the fence, but it's not that important enough. We can just drop that sentence. So there's no point in, uh, you know, we'll just, we won't have an out. If you can't, you don't have it, you have to have a minimum 100 feet or 10 square feet per unit. Don't we have in perpetuity in other places already in the ordinance? Yeah, but but his his issue is he says that you a city can't require someone to give land or make land open to the public for a discretionary permit. For a discretionary oh, for a discretionary permit. The other side of the argument is because someone's asking for relief from something, they can either opt to ask for the relief and then X, Y, and Z is required, or they can do what's the standard requirement for everyone. Um, but it's not that it's not that big of a point to debate, and if city solicitor isn't, doesn't like the language of the city of Northampton, then we'll just drop the language and not worry about it, and just say it is what it is, provided that you all feel that that's okay, that there's no other you know, way to do a smaller park. Um, and that was merely just a suggestion in case someone came up with a really creative, really tiny spot, you know, allow that as an option. And the other piece of it is, if it appears like there's a situation where there are, in the future, someone has a brilliant idea for creating a really tiny pocket park, but it's somehow the zoning language doesn't allow it, we can revisit the zoning at the time and sort of figure out what the parameters are to allow something that's smaller. So, I mean, my recommendation would be, um, since that language makes him uncomfortable, that we would just strike it. The other, the other part of this is the trade-off between reducing the size in, re in return for making it public. That's the other sticky point. And his comment is doing that has a counterintuitive effect of encouraging making smaller spaces open to everyone, while larger ones are private. So. Right, and I don't know. Of course, it's cured by deleting it, but it's just an interesting observation. Yeah. yeah. Um. Right. It also depends on the project size, too. You know, it could be, you know, a really super big project might have, might want a smaller than 10 square feet per unit, and it would still be bigger than right. a small project part. <laughs> um, so, I mean, our recommendation would be just strike the language for now. If we need to come back and revisit it, we could. Um, and then, um, incorporating the next bullet four buildings that abut existing residential property shall incorporate building articulation and well-designed side facades. We can just strike well-designed. Um, building articulation is pretty well-known term in the building trades, I think, and architectural design. So I don't have a problem with that. Um, so we could just say incorporating building articulation alongside facades. Um, and then for five, um, front facade shall have setbacks, and he did some work smoothing, setbacks similar to other buildings, and in the area we um, could substitute with along or within the block, um, and provide a different setback with a setback that's consistent with the location, either closer setbacks in a more urban area or different setbacks because of natural resource constraints. 
So his question was, why would it be different? And, it, and the issue is, if you, historical development patterns typically in these neighborhoods have houses close to, closer to the street, but in the 50s and 60s, there was, in the 70s even, there's a push to push structures back. So you might have a newer house that's in an old neighborhood that's set way back. You don't necessarily want to compare your new building facade to that one that's sort of out of context from everything else. So that was language to clarify, to state that um, you know you want to be consistent with the urban form generally in the neighborhood, and not necessarily the one building that's right next to your project. Um, or there might be a reason to have a different setback if there's a stream that comes through the property. You obviously don't want to be if it's in front of the lot. You want to build back um, to protect the stream, or whatever the other feature is. Did you actually talk to um, Attorney Seawall about Because it looks like most of these are kind of confusion on this part. What does this mean? What I didn't have a chance to talk to him after I got out. Okay. Well, my discussion with him is, you know, he's, he's reading this with the eye of it being a regulation and having to be interpreted by someone who's doing an application. Okay. So he's saying, well, my question is, I'm, I'm being the devil's advocate here, how do we clarify this so that it's a, something that he feels comfortable enforcing? So, you know, just a matter of rewriting it to make it less ambiguous. So, which where were we at? We just did setback, right? So, yeah. So we're in eleven. First six, they have. Yeah. Um, Oh, are you different? Well, no, it's, his comment is 11, but it's, oh, yeah, that's it's right. standard. Oh, it's okay. It's, it's right. connected to a standard <laughs> six. Yeah. Oh, 11, right. AS11. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got yeah. It. <laughs> yeah but it, it connects to six. Bullet six, six yeah. yeah. Um, so, no, this is not a variance from subdivision standards because it's a special permit. It's really just this is a reference to the subdivision rules. But it's not, special permit is never granting of a, something that's in the subdivision. Right, right but then it was Councillor Adams who wanted to tie this somehow to subdivision standards, correct? Right, so what, what we're saying is that the, the context or the way you design it is the same way we were required for subdivision, but you're not filing for subdivision. Okay. So it was just for reference as far as what would be required for the physical characteristics. The reference would be the subdivision line. Yeah. So, for example, they all have sidewalks. Right. And dead end streets going to have a sidewalk. Right. And so this is flexible to say there may be some compelling reason why you might not want a six foot wide sidewalk or a granite curb in a certain location. Maybe you're doing. Um, infrastructure, green infrastructure for drainage, you don't want curves. So this would allow you not to do curves in a section, um, for example. Um, Skipping to the next section, yeah. to ask a question about this one. Yeah. If something is a shared street, yeah. can it have sidewalks? Or is the concept of a shared street? The concept of a shared street is that it doesn't have sidewalks. So do you think there's any dissonance between six and seven? Since six is saying, as the subdivision chapter says, there should be sidewalks, but you could also have shared streets and have no sidewalks. Well, but so all of those six and seven is all taking language from the subdivision regs that are currently being revised so that there will be different um, provisions for different types of streets, and one of those streets is a shared street, oh, another see. street is what we call a yield street, which does require sidewalks. Oh, interesting. Thank you. And private alleys are defined in the subdivision max, um, to mm -hmm. his question. Um, so and then he wordsmithed um, eight, which is fine, and the beginning of nine. Um, and then he suggested that we enter the section of zoning for the affordability, which is exactly what you're going to talk about in a few minutes anyway, so we can just reference chapter 350, section 2.1. Um, 
And then for the number 25% or more of the units larger than 1,200 square feet, I guess I would suggest almost similarly to the idea of the park, we just drop for at least five years from certificate of occupancy. Um, his question here is whether it's appropriate to allow a by right modification to something that was granted by special permit. So, um, you know, I think that's, that is um, a valid point. I think what um, probably makes sense is just to say contains 25% or more of the units no larger than 1,200 square floor, feet of floor area, period. And if we look in the, you know, if after a period of time it seems like we should allow more flexibility about that. Maybe we come back for a zoning change and say, you know, we're getting a lot of these units, but people need to change family size or whatever the reason is. Maybe we need to reevaluate that instead of putting the out up front. This wasn't wasn't um, Director Biden's concern that someone could build small units and then break down the walls essentially and turn them into bigger units as kind of an end run. Right, so that's the reason why we said the five-year certificate of occupancy, but the reality is once you're in a special permit, mm -hmm. so if you have granted a special permit, the special permit would really say, uh, and I think this would, well, this would sort of direct the planning board to identify which units are going to be 1,200 square feet, and it would be part of the site plan, so you'd see a smaller footprint for lots one through three, let's say. Mm -hmm. And you could write in the permit that lots one, two, and three are, 12, are lots on which 1,200 square foot units have been approved and they can't you know, be any bigger. So then someone can't file a building permit because then it would be in violation of the original special permit. So I think it really just probably direct, it, it requires that the, the permit be clear. Well, that would be the case if it was in B and they were like townhouses or something, but if it was a multi, if these were multiple units in one structure. Well, it would still be, well, then you'd be identifying unit A and B are 1,200 square feet maximum. The other units have no cap or what have you. Right. Because yeah, it's easier to do if they're adjoining in a large building and if you have actually add on a building. Well, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> then you have to you have to deal with all your, your chainsaw and too. take a wall up. Right. Um, and then the last paragraph. Um, um, he basically says that you know you need an explanation for this process, and I think that's just you know this is really. We already have the process explained in the zoning, so we could just really add a reference at the end of that paragraph as spelled out in section 11.1, .1, which is the entire site plan review section. Yeah, you wouldn't want to reiterate it here. Right. And I, I guess, sorry, that's not the last one, the piece about um, uh, driveways wider than 15 feet shall be visually buffered from the side lot lines. Um, and the answer to his question is yes, that's right. <laughs> it means if something is narrower than 15 feet, we're not requiring the buffer because there's probably more vehicle tra vehicular traffic along a wider driveway than there is a standard single family house, or I guess seven units with a narrow driveway. Plus, there are already buffer requirements anyway that were approved as part of the original adoption of the zoning. So I think probably looking at this, taken out of context of the whole URB section or the URC section, he didn't see that piece of it. But it's there now. Yeah. To what extent has the housing partnership commented on this? They saw this, they commented that they really didn't like the 1,200 square foot thing. I think that was their biggest issue, um, is my understanding. And, um, I think that was basically that was that was the concern. I'm not really comfortable 
pending our public hearing on this until we have a, all of this worked out with Alan uh, so that we get a version of it that answers all of these questions. I think this because that the, the problem that makes for me is our ability to, you know, we're kind of done when we close a public hearing and got to deal with what we got. So you want me to put this, some of the things that we talked about, make those modifications and, and go over it with Alan? Yeah, I'd like, I'd like to have Alan come back and say, okay, this this is good with me, so that if we close the public hearing and okay. send it to council, that, that we cross that bridge and it doesn't pop up at that level. Because okay. then it gets kind of unruly. It's easier at council to come back and say, solicitor likes this. You know, it's had its process. The solicitor likes it. We can, I mean, there could still be questions there, but at least it isn't. What do you mean the solicitor still has yeah. questions with this? Yeah, I agree, and um, like you and everyone else, I only saw these solicitors, solicitors' comments today. That's when they came in. Yeah. But they seem they seem very substantive and involved, and I'm not confident we could. I mean, we could delete. We could just delete everything that is a problem with you. I'm not, and I'm, you I'm know, not suggesting that's what you're saying, but selectively delete. Mm -hmm. um, I'd rather actually work it out with them than just chopping things out helter skelter because I mean I do have some respect for the fact that the planning board put a lot of time into this, and uh, yeah. so if they, you know if there's references to be made and, and things that he's unaware of, I think it's better to get him up to speed with why it is what it is to be respectful to the planning board's efforts rather than say well let, we'll just cut it out for yeah. expediency purposes. It'd be better to make it actually right, including many good ideas that came from the planning board about, about the park, for example. Because these things, heaven knows, I mean, we've made a, in the last year, we've made more changes to zoning than happens, than have happened since 1975, and zoning tends to hang around for a while, so I kind of like to get it right, yeah. so that we can live, because, you know, who knows, it's not that easy to change zoning, we're trying to get it right in the first place. Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. that's fine. So. Um, are you thinking August 4th? Is that when's your next meeting? Do you have a meeting in August or no? No. Okay. So, so we September? next meet in September. Okay. What's the date of that? Um, September 8th. Okay. Well, um, actually. Well, that's the second Monday, but I don't know. Because of the going. holiday, we were talking about meeting on the 22nd. Okay. Because the, the 15th isn't available because of veteran services and social services and veterans affairs or something. So we're talking about meeting. On the 20th. The holiday is September 1st. First, correct. And then. So your normal, you normally meet the second Monday? Is that the second right? Monday, but, but that would free the aid for public safety. Oh, I see. Okay. You could kick that, because that was, that lands on the first. Right. And, okay. that, and that committee wasn't talking about meeting. And We're not going to meet, and most likely we just talk to the chief, and it looks like he doesn't have anything really so, important. So that could be the 8th, okay. theoretically, and then we jump to the 22nd. Does so that? That sounds reasonable. Yeah, can, you, can you just ask a clarification question? Are you canceling August meeting because you have it on the docket? I think we are. Because I, I, I think we'll I discuss that more before we adjourn, but you I, can't I, be here for yeah. that. And I don't know of anything else on the agenda, something we were talking about not having that one. Okay, so because council isn't going to be around to send us anything. Right. Right. We're not meeting to the 14th. So. Okay, so I'll cancel yeah. that. So we have a motion to continue yeah. the public hearing for the, we still got the other two things we want to talk to you about that are in. Yeah. We'll get those done. Yeah, I, w I would move we continue until our, our next meeting in September. Which is the 20th. 22nd. Be the 22nd, uh, again at 5.30. Okay. 5 o'clock? Well, the public hearing's at Manhattan at 5. It's whatever you want it to be, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It well, could five, be 5 or 5.30. 5. 5.30 good for you. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's happy. So my, my, my complete motion is to continue this until our next meeting on September 22nd. Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion on that? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Then on to the public hearing on what's next? Farms, forests, and rivers. And that's been everywhere, correct? Yeah. That's been to Edlu. Planning board. That's been to the planning board. Everybody's been positive on that. Any questions for Carolyn on that's just sort of consolidating all the conservation land and right. all of its classifications in the farm forest. Right. Okay. Um, 
Right. Now, just um, so you know, there is there are two bits of parcels. Of par there are two bits containing two parcels. Two bits. That um, they're tiny bits. bits. <laughs> Um, that will probably be removed from the request for rezoning because we're in the process of acquisition, but we haven't closed on them yet. So, so as not to trump anything, we'll pull those back from your final vote um, when it goes back to September because we don't own it was, the closing is taking much longer than we thought it was going to take. So. Um, what we'll do is put a new map that takes those tiny little parcels out. I can't remember even how many acres. It's a small amount next to Fitzgerald Lake. But other than that, these are all currently. Are those the pieces we talked about at last council meeting to purchase? Uh, probably, yes. Probably. Bollinger? Yeah. Yes. So Far Forest and Rivers is basically city owned property. It's all city owned property. Except for, Except for those two bits. people. Right. The two bits. <laughs> which will be there when we bite them. Yes. <laughs> but when we when they're supposed to come, so yes. it'll be a map that excludes them. Right. Exactly. Do, can I ask a question? Do we ever put in effective dates? Can we put an effective date on this of like six months from now? And therefore we wouldn't have to pull anyone out if this would just happen in six months. I, I think the question was whether or not it would in any way, whether there'd be any possibility that um, it would confuse or hold up the closing, right? Um, it's not going to hold up the closing. It's more about we're presenting that these are all city-owned property. And if they're not all city-owned at the time, then, you know, we could certainly be open about that. But I think... You know, there's no real hurry. We just thought it would be efficient and put that one in because we knew it was going forward and now it's just slowing down. So, you know, we can just put it in the next set that comes or we'll in another play it, year. Or we'll play it by ear because if we, I mean, it comes out of here tonight. Yeah. Then it shows up one on the 14th. Mm -hmm. But then we don't meet again until September, so. Yeah. If it happens before your second reading, I suppose we could pop it back in or pull it out. Before. Pull it out for the second reading. Yeah. Go be, Maybe, think yeah. positively that we hope we'll close, okay. but if we don't, say we. Yeah. Because we can always postpone a second reading if you think you're going to make it in a two week period, <laughs> you know. True. And yeah. then we don't have to. Okay, so maybe you just leave it in for now, but just yeah. know that. Okay, that. it may come out later. Okay. okay. Any other questions for Carolyn on this one? Yeah. Does somebody want to make a motion for. A, well, actually, we got to close the public hearing on this first before we do that. I move to close the public hearing. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Right. Somebody got to descend with a positive recommendation. Farm Forest and Rivers. Yes. I'll second. Okay. Any discussion? In favor? Aye. And then the last one is the affordability. Right. So um, the language uh, we currently have a definition of affordable housing, um, and the proposal is to um, create a distinction between affordable rental units and affordable home ownership units. And that's what the underlying um, language is that's in front of you. Um, and it's really changing the timeline for what the restriction is, the affordability restriction is for um, the um, home ownership units. Um, to reduce it from 99 years to 30 years. Um, and that's come up because um, it has become, it's, we found that it's a, it's a different, it's a variation from what the state requires when they're issuing tax credits for affordable housing for homeownership units. They only have a 30 year requirement and ours is much more uh, stringent in terms of length of time mm -hmm. and so um, and it's been this way for a long time uh, but we've had more difficulty recently with interfacing with the state we interfacing with the state but also with the end users they need to it is a um, it's hard for them to go through the lottery process and, and you know and 30 30 years is a long time as it is um, and then for rental units, so the difference between that and rental units is usually one 
entity, a nonprofit or some corporation that's holding all the rental units, and it's not really a big deal for them to hold it for, you know, 99 years. That's what they do with affordable housing. But for home ownership units, we're talking about individuals, so it makes it more complicated for financing and, and change in ownership. Did this go to the housing partnership? Yes. I see Ed Lou. They're yes. not mentioned in here. What did they say to say about it? They, um, they supported the change. And then they've seen you know requests from people coming in as well. And, and it, it's come up most recently with Habitat for Humanity um, with their units on um, having a problem. And why didn't Edlu take a position on her? Um, because the housing partnership had not yet looked at it when we met. Yet the committee wanted to move it along. So okay. they made no recommendation. In deference to the housing partnership. Exactly. And when was because the housing partnership just met like last week or something? So I think that was after we had your meeting. It was. Yeah, that's we were waiting until. Right. Okay. But Ed Lou's. That's why they waited, but the housing partnership concurs that this is the right, right. direction. All right. I, and I think it's. I mean, I think it's good that we first get credit under 40B for affordable housing we have. Mm -hmm. And I think home ownership units being 30 years is actually good for upward mobility for people. Mm -hmm. Do you have any more questions on this? No, I'll move it uh, forward with the House of Recommendations. Well, we got to close public hearing first. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll move to close the public hearing. On this uh, On this one? Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And I'll move it forward. Second. Okay. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good. Two out of three ain't bad. Okay. All righty. Any. Um, New business, I think, with that covers our agenda, correct? And we did everything we needed to do for our agenda. Any new business, anyone else? So, sorry, I was, I, I was thinking, we used to meet at 6, and that was as long ago as last time. So, for, for our meeting then, we will, thank you, Hi, Carolyn. Carolyn. Good night. So, we will officially cancel any meeting for August, because you're not going to be here anyway. And set a September meeting for five o'clock on the twenty second. Okay. Sounds good. Good. And then you'll let us know if you're gonna would follow well, safety. I, we are gonna pub, uh, I'll, You'll take the eighth. Well, I, yeah, we'll take the eighth in September for public safety if we can, because mm -hmm. I haven't notified everyone yet, but it looks like the chief doesn't have anything really for us. So. And then. Uh, just, and then we won't. That won't be in August either. That will be on August. Whatever that is. First. August. Public safety. Public safety was August fourth. That won't be on August fourth. So with a with our with our schedule squared away, a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? All right. Thank you.